I am so excited that Steve Patterson is with us this time. This is we, the last two numpties we did. They were like a couple of years apart, but it was just me and Derek. So I feel like Wait. we're just one piece shy. We just need TK. The honor is all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve's well, been in his cave working on his book. No, dude, I'm much. ready. I've got a uh, little, little whiskey in the John Galt Mortgage Company tumbler. Oh. So uh, shout out Tim Charmack. Shameless, shameless and, uh, promotion. Mitchell Broderick. Steve, yeah. I guess we'll start because I have like three big topics that I want to go over and they have like some subtopics. So one is the Copa case. One is an update in sort of the crypto world in general. And then one is the book. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Let's start on the book. Let's, Let's start, start with the book. book for sure. So yeah, first, yeah, congratulations. We got to push the book first. So if people get bored of us, they, they know that they need to buy the book. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's been a long time coming. Um, for people who don't know, I, I co-wrote a book with Roger Veer. And uh, it's the the untold story of what the heck happened to Bitcoin over the period. Really, the key period of like 2014 to 2017, Bitcoin was hijacked. It's called hijacking Bitcoin: the hidden history of BTC. And despite this being the most important timeline in Bitcoin's history and uh, an articulation of a perspective that was the dominant perspective up until like 2015 to 2017, this story hasn't been written properly. It's not been told. People who have tried to tell it have done it incompetently. They haven't, it hasn't been researched. So this is, to my knowledge, the first like deep historical take on big blockerism and, you know, what, what happened to, uh, what happened to Bitcoin. Uh, how There's do you, a handful like... of articles out there that are kind of like, you know, the little, little timelines and stuff like that, but there's nothing that actually took the entire narrative from start to finish and actually put the facts together in a way that you can follow. Cause it's very hard to do. Number one. Yeah. Very hard to do. Um, also, um, I think the, I mean, the only other book out there that's even remotely comparable is like the block size wars, which I think yeah. we both read and it's, it's, I, I, I found myself like shaking the book in anger every yeah. time. I would, like, yeah. Go to the next and it's page. poorly like, hey, written too. Like it's poorly the, written. The, right. Yes. Um, yeah, the best article that I've seen, the most in-depth one was that Hacker Noon article that's like, I don't know, 10,000 words long or something, and it goes through the timeline, right. but it it doesn't prep you conceptually with quite right. an appreciation for the understanding of just how crazy the hijacking was. Like the, the hijacking Bitcoin is in three parts. The first part, part one is like, this is how the technology was originally designed. These are a bunch of Satoshi quotes, a bunch of Mike Kern, Gavin Andreessen quotes. So it's unambiguous. This really is how the system was designed. And then part two is the the critical history of how the takeover happened. So part two without part one or just the history without understanding like the, how the tech was designed, it doesn't quite pack the same punch. So when by the end of part one, when people are reading it, they're going to go, oh, okay, obviously big blocks makes more sense and it just makes the unfolding events of what happened to bitcoin that much more shocking and scandalous and ridiculous you know when you it, when you have no, it's it's so i am so happy that you've put this book together even though i haven't read it yet i i already know from all these conversations what's in there um like the number of times people will see stuff that we're tweeting or numpty stuff or whatever and dm me and say hey i'm kind of new to bitcoin i just got into it whatever what what is this stuff you what are you criticizing? Do you like <laughs> not like Bitcoin? What is this? Right. And it's so I don't know what to say because I'm yeah. like, uh, go watch like 30 hours of Numpty's video. I don't know. <laughs> Even there, we start from well into the history. So yeah, I, I remember I remember whenever um the book of Satoshi came out, somebody just compiled all of Satoshi's like public writings and emails and put it in a book called the Book of Satoshi. And it's actually yeah. really good because it's just all source material. And I I got that years and years ago. And I read through it all. And not long after that was the first time I started hearing about this thing that Bitcoin can't scale. I remember I heard Nick Sabo on like Tim Ferriss's podcast or something. And he was like, yeah, Bitcoin, uh, it's probably, probably can't scale. You know, I did layer twos or something. And I remember being like, that, that doesn't sound right. And that sounds like really disappointing. Like I thought you just use Bitcoin as money. And like, Going from there, and then you and I, I mean, we've been talking for almost 10 years about this stuff, Steve and Derek as well, and seeing and watching all these things unfold, watching all these posts and forums and these emails and watching all these crazy psyops, like legitimate psyops, like legitimate social engineering operations planned and executed purposefully. Now, there's a lot of spontaneous stuff too, right. but a lot of this stuff to live through it and to watch it all. And then when someone's like, what is it you don't like about Bitcoin? I'm like, 
I, I don't know how to answer. I can, there's too much. And the conclusion is it's it's also hard to explain to somebody just how insane one megabyte forever is because <laughs> it doesn't sound reasonable. You're talking multiple orders of magnitude level crazy. So right. when when like I, I just had somebody the other day who should have known better who's had who who I had a debate with once like years ago and kind of embarrassed the gentleman and he had time to research and for whatever reason he didn't so he decided to write an article preempting hijacking bitcoin because it's coming out April 5th and he wrote an article trying to debunk it even though he didn't read it it's a very bad situation anyway <laughs> in, in, in this exchange I had he was he, I, uh, man he he said we can, big blocks can't work because it would mean that people who wanted to run a full node would have to have a gigabit <laughs> internet connection at scale. And I'm like, it is incredible to me that, that people are so propagandized and stuck in this cult that somebody would actually write that argument down and like present it publicly online and not feel shame. Because Here, here's, here's the analogy, Steve. <laughs> It'd yeah. be like someone writing an article today. Remember in the 90s when people write articles about how like the internet will never be able to handle, you know, videos or something? Yeah, yeah. It'd be like someone writing an article today. Today, saying, yes. You cannot have a website with images because right. the internet cannot handle it. Right. Exactly. Like what <laughs> in the world are you talking about? And this is somebody who's trying to make calculations at scale, meaning like billions of people using the technology. And he's like, well, that couldn't work because you need a gigabit internet connection to run a full node, which people don't even need to run in this vision. So it's like, I, I said, I said on social media, I was like, I don't even know how to categorize this style of argument. The, X couldn't work because it would it would necessitate Y, but we already have Y, therefore X can't work. I'm like, what? That is a, a new type of logical fallacy. What annoys me so much too about this obsession with with nodes is that who's going to run one if they can't afford to transact on the chain? Like if, <laughs> yeah. if, if the if the global if like ter Turd Demester or Turd Demeter, I forget how to pronounce it. Turd Meister. Turd Meister, right? You know, he said once, like, the goal of, of the, you know, the scaling plan that they have is that transacting on chain will be like an oil tanker. Like, yeah, like, it'll be like chartering an oil tanker. Yeah, be like yeah. chartering an oil tanker. So who's going to run a note? Like, if it's that specialized, it's only going to be people, you Wait, know. Like, you guys... You guys don't let your personal computer be used by Chase Bank to process right. their I mean, transactions. Saifdeen Amus, who you know this book uh, criticizes rightfully uh, various points, um, he said in a talk like, eh, "We'll have like, you know, only a handful of people will will actually use a node, and and they'll be like the central banks of Bitcoin, and they'll be running nodes." And it's like, so 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 what's this concern then about <laughs> about internet connections, you know, like right. some guy in a hut in, in Africa is not running a node is certainly not if he can't yeah. make a payment. And, and on top of all of that, right, with SPV, you can still verify your own transactions. That would right. just mean the person in the hut couldn't verify that a transaction that took place in Zimbabwe in 2013 was <laughs> accurate. Well, right. there, and, there's but, something there's something so relevant about this book, even if you don't care about Bitcoin at all, even if you're like, I don't know if Steve's point of view is right. right. Watching someone chronicle how something that is so obviously correct and technically sound could be the absolute opposite could be believed and like thought to be so cool and the bandwagon effect and all to watch like the way that how masses of people can believe yeah. completely incorrect things. I mean, we saw yeah. this with COVID. We've seen this in a lot of ways. So, like, there's a there's a sociological aspect. But but I got to ask you before I before I forget, how did you like? What was the process of choosing what makes it into the book? I mean, because I've seen mm. again, like almost a decade talking with you two and, and others, right. and Derek, I have seen your copious amounts of source <laughs> material that right. you, with your internet sleuthing skills, have pulled right. up from every forum, every. Anyone who's I ever think I had the biggest archive Bitcoin, in the world. Of, there's of there's so history. much and like narrowing the scope of what you want to cover. Yeah. What was that process like? And yeah. Like deciding it, what makes the cut. Because I was like, there needs to be a director's cut version. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say of the information that I had assembled and that I have in my head, I probably put about a third of it in the book. So I'm going to say there's about two thirds that didn't make it in. And it's kind of periphery stuff. I tried to put all the core information to get the, the clearest perspective from somebody who's a long-term big blocker. What did it look like? 
What did the key, pair, key players do? What did the key players say? And I try to put all of that essentially in the book, but there's still, I mean, there's still stuff I come across now that I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, dang, I really should have put it in there. And even in the, because I, I, this book took a few years to write. Over the course of the years, stuff is still unfolding actively. Just in the past few months, stuff is still unfolding actively. So it's like, I, it, it's 200 and I think uh, if you don't include the references, there's 280 some odd references in there, but there's like 250 pages worth of material. And I feel like that really is going to, that is going to pre present the cl the clearest case without getting too sucked into the weeds. Yes. Yeah. I did the audiobook uh, um uh, recently and there's a couple parts there's still a couple chapters in the middle where I'm going this is pretty this is pretty in the weeds it's pretty heavy and it's kind of unavoidable it's all important information but on net compared to all the information that was out there I feel like I did a pretty damn good job of keeping it interesting and engaging and entertaining even with a little bit of uh you know, heaviness there in the, in the middle. It's a very it, it, hard story to tell. And I know I've, as you've seen, like I've, I've put together timelines before that I haven't published, you know, of stuff, just like lengthy time. It's, it's heavy and it's hard. And some of it's like, you kind of know, but you can kind of guess what's going on, but it's speculative a little bit. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah. include that in yeah. the book or not. Yeah. Like I well, have- And some of it, it, some of it's like vibes too, right? So when you think about the way that these things unfold, the way that an idea becomes infectious and takes hold, sometimes the only way, and like in the social media era, this is hard, how do you take this and translate into a book? Sometimes the only way to sort of convey is to say, here's a tweet by an influential person two years ago, and then right. here's a tweet right. by them two years exactly. later saying the opposite thing. And here's all the people that like loved that, who did, and like, <laughs> yeah. how do you, when you're in it, you experience it, but putting that into book form in this world of like, forums and social media everywhere yeah. and like half the things people are texting you funny memes and, and you just sort of see the zeitgeist shift but trying yeah. to document that has got to be hard there was also yes. a lot of scrubbing right like yes i remember we, you and i had several conversations about like oh do you have a, a, a you know a yeah a this thing this? that i know yes. happened and right. then could find it you know right i had one where i had a you know i had i had tweets responding to the person but like i just for, for the life of me i could not find yeah. the original post and it was like really juicy you know it was like one of those yeah, ones, yeah. Like, i have to have this because this is such <laughs> a dunk on this person's yes character really you know well yeah uh, I, I, i'm sorry let me interrupt you, you here I, I did want to um i did want to respond more fully to the question isaac uh a big part of the assembly process of getting this information was talking with different people like derek so well, I, I, he just, I think he just muted. I don't know if you heard that. I was just, I'm listening. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. I'm glad you heard that. Yeah. Cause you know, I've been calling Derek the, or we've been calling Derek the Bitcoin historian and he's done just a crazy amount of work. The, you know, the amount of information that he assembled was huge. He helped me with that, put the big pile together. Plus that hacker noon article that I mentioned was very good. Right. Um, so there are a couple of key, key players here, just in the mass accumulation of information that you sort through. I did want to say one more thing, though, um, just to complete an, an earlier thought about one of the difficulties with the book and, and talking with people about the story is to communicate just how absurd one megabyte blocks is. Um, it's like not even orders of magnitude reasonable. There's another re related difficulty, which is being able to communicate sometimes how ham fisted the corruption is. Um, I'll give a I'll give an analogy. I recently did a, a an interview with Tom Woods. He had me on on his show to talk about the dark age hypothesis, which I've been working on for a little bit. And he was very interested in this idea. And we were talking about research about breakfast. And he had there was some other researcher who wrote a book called like breakfast is not the most important meal of the day or something. And it was a guy like debunking this notion that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And so he goes down the rabbit hole. And this researcher says, actually, this idea that we've all heard that it's the most important meal essentially comes from like the cereal companies buying off scientists to, to create this research. And it sounds, the, I, I bring this up because Tom used this great term that it sounds cartoonish. Like the villain in that story is cartoonish. It's the big cereal company buying the scientists off to say breakfast is the most, imp most important meal of the day. That sounds silly. Same thing here, exact same situation here with Bitcoin is you've got at a back, who's the CEO of Blockstream, who was employing the most important key developers at the most critical time in Bitcoin's history, is literally himself personally shilling his proprietary network called the Liquid Network <laughs> as an alternative to on-chain scaling. There's a tweet that's in the book where he says, 
are, are you frustrated by the high fees on Bitcoin? I'm paraphrasing. Use the liquid network and you can settle faster for cheaper. Hashtag, you know, be part of the solution. And it's right. like, this is the guy, this is the CEO of the guy that was employing the devs publicly shilling <laughs> his alternative <laughs> blockchain. Right. You can't make that up. You know, it's it, it, it really, it, it, it just... It's almost sounds, it sounds cartoonish. Yeah, you got, you got to make the lie so insane and so out in the open that people be like, no, come on, who would do that? It's so unsophisticated. Yes. So uh, we got (laughs) to shout out the fact that there's been zero marketing for this book. I remember you were, Derek was like, hey, it's available. And you were like, it is? I didn't know. I know. (laughs) I went to bed. Yeah. Several categories. Uh, It's blowing up. The the Kindle just became available. This is not some uh, coordinated rollout, but you can see. There's an interest in it. And you've gotten a shit ton of uh, pre-bunking, which I think helps helps more people want to read the book. There's been a ton of people out there saying crazy stuff without reading it already. So The responses are amazing. It, it reminds me of 2017, 2018. And uh, a similar thing happened where a lot of people started looking into Bitcoin Cash just because of all the insane replies to Roger Ver. Like yeah. I remember you would see these uh, posters circulating on Twitter, like Roger Ver, known terrorist who sold, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, uh, uh, and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. And you looked at that, you're like, why is this guy getting so much hate? I need to look at this because this doesn't seem rational. And, and same thing with the with the book now, you post about it and the responses you get are like hilarious. They remind me very much of, of 2017, yeah. right? And it's like, oh, you know, a rational person on the outside looking at that might be like, maybe I should read this. Yeah. And uh, something that has actually surprised me is that, I guess it shouldn't have surprised me, is I thought they'd be a little bit more sophisticated, but I was just scrolling through, like there is a lot of these you know, tweets and most of them I just ignore, but I try to make note, what percentage of these have cartoon profile pictures, right. you know, that are clearly like pseudonymous or anonymous accounts? It's very high percentage. It's yeah. 80, 80, 90 percent still are these. Greg, Greg Maxwell had to fire up the old. Uh, <laughs> Essentially. <card. laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So that hasn't they haven't upgraded from that tactic. You know, I don't know. I, I thought they'd at least like generate a fake AI face. That's not that hard, you know. Well, well, we missed favorite. our episode last week or last a couple of weeks ago. We, we were talking about this. Like they're they're kind of running on fumes. They're not, you know, that the power that they once had is not there. They're really not cool anymore. And I just don't think they're gonna have the same effect this time. Uh, you know, they're not going to scare people away from reading this book. If this book came out in 2017, you know, they they, they intimidate people right. and say, you know, you don't read it. Right. But now, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and my, I'm... my favorite responses, by the way, are have been to you, Derek, when you've shared, you just tweeted about the book, like, hey, go get this book. It's a great book. And you've had some comments here and there. And the, <laughs> people blowing up and being like, Derek is, Derek is just trying to shill and like, make money and i'm thinking oh the affiliate link i made eight (laughs) dollars how is derek trying to make trying to make money on an amazon book that's like twenty dollars for I'm I'm I, I've lost all my money in the the bsv scam and i'm produced to <laughs> selling affiliate links look if there's anyone who has the absolute ruthless mercenary ability to know what the market's going to do even if it's completely opposite of what he believes should happen it's derek so right. i know that this dude he knows how to get on the meme coin train he knows when the tops are in and how to like <laughs> this dude's not losing money on anything he's just got the magic touch Right. You know, I might be uh, biased here, um, given that I spent a long time, you know, assembling this book, but I do get the feeling that there's a different zeitgeist right now in terms of people being open to seeing capture in places that they previously didn't think it was possible. So COVID was a part of this, right? People lost a lot of faith in the establishment or they're like, oh my gosh, the corruption's very deep. The media is totally corrupt. The experts are co- totally corrupt. So I, I I, sort of think there's at least a possibility here that the idea, that the meme of Bitcoin was hijacked fits nicely into 2024 in a way that it wouldn't have in 2019. Do you guys get the same impression? Yeah, I, th- I think there's there's multiple things going on. There's there's that whole component. The whole, the culture at large has changed, and then the culture within Bitcoin has changed. And I think the social cost of being aware of the truth is much lower now. Mm. Um, you know, it's 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 like we've talked about in on Boxer. It's really bizarre to see someone like let's say like Nick Carter, for example, see these Satoshi emails that came out during the Craig Wright case and be like, wow, 
this would have changed everything if these emails were <laughs> maybe Satoshi was a big blocker, right? It's like, oh man, oh, come on, gosh. come on, right? Those emails we don't really tell us anything new. Very, there's a couple of interesting ones, right? But generally, they don't tell us anything new about Satoshi's intentions. Um, and, and it's, but I think it just comes down to the social cost or the social reward. Of, mm -hmm. You know, there was a reward for being like an idiot and uh, an aggressive dummy in 2017, 2018, that's not there anymore. And now it's like, it's okay, you know, because of that, now you can actually look at the truth and treat it maybe a bit more objectively. Well, and then just start to watch like the videos and tweets by like Max Kaiser or like <laughs> these paid influencers right. going down to visit the dictatorship in South America. That's a Bitcoin haven using taxpayer dollars for bit. And just the feel and look of them it feels it feels like a grift. It feels right. like grifters who are pretending to be counterculture, but they're captured. And people are now more savvy to this. They sort of understand. They've seen this in other domains. And I just think it's like, just the aesthetic alone is like, yeah. eh, that looks kind of scammy, frankly. Because it is. Yeah, right. it is. And there has been significant institutional investment now in Bitcoin. It, it's And... and Part of what I want to do, you know, I'm not going to do too many interviews on this, but um, I do want to do some. And one of the messages I want to communicate is, do you really think, first of all, that the financial establishment of all establishment is establishments is going to be unaware that Bitcoin has the possibility of being a revolutionary technology. Like, are these the time, given the corruption that's happened everywhere, do you really think that like the central bankers are just going to be caught off guard? For, for 15 years one? now. For 15 <laughs> years. Yeah, exactly. And and if maybe they're aware with that, what would institutional capture of Bitcoin look like? Right. You know, you got to play out the scenarios in your head. Do you think they would break it outright? Would they just try to slow it down and control all the on roads and off roads and like recreate the banking system on top of Bitcoin? If you think about what it might look like for the institutions to capture Bitcoin, it looks exactly like you would expect today. Exactly. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And I, again, I think people are maybe going to be a little bit more savvy when they see that. And then you see Adam back shilling the liquid network explicitly <laughs> as his alternative. It's like, okay, maybe it's not a mystery. No, it, it's so true, Steve, because it's sort of like, okay, hold on, hold on, slow this thing down. Can we gum up the works? Can we throw a few people in prison early on to scare people? And then can we sort of like put up some vagaries that like regulation is maybe coming. So you're on unsure territory, whether you should invest a lot in doing stuff on here. Can we, can we cripple the protocol? Can we, and then once we get a good look for it, cause these, these bureaucratic banking type or institutions are slow. They are slow. That's one of their disadvantages, but they get enough time and they're like, Oh, you know what? There's some benefits here. This yeah. is actually more controllable and more trackable and more traceable than cash. Hmm. Maybe yeah. we can work with this, right? Yeah, and everybody's <laughs> like, yeah. Go ahead. It's basically like a CBDC dressed up, you know, at this point, the way it is, it's like a CBDC dressed up as a revolutionary cypherpunk currency. When you think about it, though, it's like everybody's holding it on in exchanges because it's not really money. So everything's trackable, traceable. Like we all, they have all of our financial information. You make a transaction, like they're, they're, they're sending you a 1099 or tax form, right? And, um, you know, like it's, it's like they don't need to do anything else the the they've gotten the the revolutionaries to to do what they want while still thinking they're they're revolutionary yeah and essentially pay them off right, right. if you go along with this and you you put your energies behind mm -hmm. pushing btc you can make you know a lot of people made a lot of money here so you you get you you know what are the chances that the blackrock approved bitcoin is revolutionary Bitcoin. I don't think it's a very high chance. It, it's, it's, the, it's the perfect the... op though, right? It's the perfect op because you're like a bunch of kind of fringy types who Absolutely. aren't usually on top of the pecking order. Hey, you get to make money and feel like a rebel hero. Right. That stupid Apple thing that automatically does a thumbs up bump. That's the <laughs> dumbest software. Yeah, I was like, are we streaming or something? No, it does that. I don't even know how to turn it off. Whenever you do this anywhere, the freaking Mac will do a thumbs up anyway. Right. Now, the, the, the reward kind of melts your brain 
speak. And, yeah. and I see this in, in the responses uh, to, well, to the book again, which is the, you see people like, hey, you know, Roger Ver tried, his, uh, tried to have his version of, Bit, uh, of Bitcoin and the price is crap. So therefore the market has spoken and, and therefore the reason Bitcoin cash didn't succeed like like they had hoped is is you know it's 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 because the big the blocks were you know the blocks were small or blocks were big so you know they measure it purely off of the price which like price is a useful signal but hey not- listen listen guys Pfizer's stock went up therefore the vaccines that they produced have proven to be the best possible the market thing. has spoken right yep. the market has spoken uh, yeah. w- before we move off of the book topic is there a way can we queue up a little a little jam, a little nugget from the audio book. Um, <laughs> I would love to play that. Okay. While you're finding that. <laughs> Wait. Uh, yeah. Hang on. I while you have it on Voxer. Can I do that? Would that yeah, work? try it. Try looking okay. for it while Steve. What, okay. okay. Yeah, I did want to say one more thing. This is, um, I hope somebody will um, put on their agenda to make a short book on this topic because I couldn't do it justice. Um, the Lightning Network got one chapter, chapter nine. It's an excellent chapter. It's devastating to the uh, to the idea of lightning. However, what is not captured in the book is just how much was riding on the Lightning Network working, just how many lies were told because of lightning and the promise of lightning, stretching back to 2014, maybe. Yep. It was relentless. At 18 that time, months, 18 months away, 18 for months 10 away. Years. It's revolutionary. This is going to be the, this is going to be the scaling solution that without the concept of lightning there that was able to be put forward so people could see it as at least maybe an alternative to big block uh, scaling. If that didn't exist, small blocks would have made no sense to anybody. They Never had to have the lightning network for years as a, as this promised alternative. And just now I'm seeing a lot of people start to admit in 2024, good heavens, this technology sucks and it's not going to give us real scaling of Bitcoin. Oh, that this, is this... so significant. And I hope somebody writes, you know, 150 pages just on this and how many promises that were made that were broken and embarrasses those people. Oh, this is so great. It's a good transition too to the uh, some of the other topics. But but it, but it is amazing, Steve, because you see it's literally the exact same playbook you'll see politicians do where it's like, yeah. hey, I'm going to do something that sucks in the short term. You're all going to hate it. But I've got this thing that's coming. Like, don't worry. This is the thing we're going to pin all our hopes on. And we just like, don't worry. This will save us. And it was so simple, so stupid. I mean, it was always a bad idea. I don't even think, this is why I've always said this. I don't even think lightning was ever intended to work. I think it literally was built just to be a thing on the horizon to make you believe that it's okay to limit the block size because we'll solve it on this new thing. Maybe. And- my, my my guess, just from living through it and, ha- and being a little more connected to the dev tech side of things, just talking with them, I really think it was um, a ton of idealistic uh, overconfident autists who thought, "Oh my gosh, this sounds so cool! This is so scalable." They had all the buzzwords. Oh, it's and then and then every six months there would be some new thing. There's going to be watchtowers, and there's going to be this new technical thing. They got so titillated by the idea of this really fancy new technology that they were going to be a part of. I really think that sucked a ton of people in, where at least a large percentage of them thought. The actual tech itself was going to work. Don't you think yeah, it's like a combination they, of both, though? Like, yeah, I, I yeah, like, yeah, right. exactly. Like, like, like they some of those, like the Adam back types pushing a lightning. It, it almost feels like they never really expected it or wanted it to work. And like, liquid was going to be mm, like, that's like possible. oh, you know, we're yes. going to have these pr- private sort of proprietary networks. And that's what you see now. You see like most of these people who are using lightning or using from, from day one, from not day really one. using lightning. They're using payments, proprietary and. No, that that's my thing. From day one, it was like, we need to cripple. We need to shrink the, keep the block size tiny. That means transactions won't work. So we need some way for people to be okay with this. The Lightning Network's number one job was to make people be okay with it by pinning their hopes on it. If it happened to also work, okay, that's cool yeah. too. But that yeah. wasn't the main priority. The main priority was it's the thing that you get to keep saying is coming. Did you right. find that clip? Derek? Yeah, I did. I did. I'm going to play it. Um okay. All right, uh, you guys, let me know if it's if well. You, well, you gotta give, you gotta set it okay, up. I'll, I'll, I'll sell it. I'll, I'll sell it yeah. first. So we were having okay. this discussion about the audio book. By the way, Steve is an amazing uh, voice recorder, and so is his brother Sam. Like, I, you guys are both just like incredible. Oh, thanks. Um, 
but uh, Steve was was he was recording the part with tone bays, and he he said he couldn't stop hearing that voice in his head when he was recording. And so we were like, well, you know, I think I, one of us suggested that Steve should actually record it as as tone vase and do his tone vase impersonation. If you guys know tone, it's 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 hilarious. And so I'm gonna play it. And I, I think it's actually in the audiobook. Is, is that is, correct? Yeah. So you have yeah. this to look forward to. This is a reason to buy both the book and the <laughs> audiobook. The following is a quote from a YouTube conversation you between him and Jimmy yeah. Song. Vase starts by fielding a question from the audience. Quote. Here's a question for you, Jimmy. <laughs> Somebody says what benefit do I get from setting up my own lightning node? Uh, you can go and pay people like in lightning. Wait a minute. I need clarification on that. Do I have to have my own lightning node in order to pay people through lightning? Yes. Really? really? <laughs> yes, because the only way you can pay anyone is by having a channel. And you can't have a channel unless you have a node. But do you need your own node? Or do you need somebody else's? You need your own node. Oh, wow. So every single person might need their own lightning node. Yeah. In the conversation. So let's... Pretty let's, good. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, <laughs> hilarious. I've, I've listened to it many times and I always laugh. But the, you don't want to get distracted by the humor because there's actually an important point in this conversation to understand, right? It's just you had a guy who was a popular influencer, Bitcoin. I call them Bitfluencers. This is the guy who was debating Roger Ver on that that cruise. Um, actually, no, I think Jimmy was debating him, but Jimmy was, was yeah. There. Tom was around there running his mouth the whole time. And um, but this is a guy who's like invited on shows to talk about Bitcoin who pushed lightning religiously loudly vociferously mm, being right. like lightning will solve all this and he had a, a a public uh discussion where he basically confessed in a sense that he didn't know anything about how it was supposed to work had never had never used it before had no idea that you had to run a node uh seemed like started troubled by this and this was like at least at least a year after he had been shilling it right oh yeah this is way way longer than that one one of the things that's scandalous is you can hear him the reason he asked that question is because for the first time ever right. he's trying to think through the concepts <laughs> and then he realized hang on everybody has to run their own no <laughs> this is a problem <laughs> I have to use it or somebody else's. That's a very natural thing to think. Sorry, that's ir irresistible. That's why I had to go in the book. <laughs> it's a very natural question. Wait, you mean to tell me that this lightning network thing requires, I personally, not I don't get to use somebody else's. I have to run my own node on my smartphone. I have to download the whole blockchain. Right. I have to keep the channel. I have to be connected to the internet personally. <laughs> so that you're hearing in real time him right. think through that concept for the first time and realize, Oh, geez, maybe that's actually not a good idea. Right. So he's shocked. He's shocked to think that can't possibly be right. Well, the at fact least that he... this wasn't a more shameful moment. Like a, <laughs> yeah. this, this should this would be something that is is warrants public ridicule. And like we should never listen to this guy again. And by the way, he's not the only person. He's not. Well, well here, here's he's the thing. Cormac had the same thing where he admitted a year or two later to having never even tried to set a note up. And how long ago were both of those? Literally just in the last few weeks, John Carvalho or whatever his name is, like came out saying, uh, I've spent the last two years trying to build something on Lightning and turns out Lightning is terrible. This 2024, this dude was like pompous, like aggressive, right? Anti-big block. This is the guy who got the famous, you know, Roger Ver middle finger. He was one of the most aggressive dummies during the whole big block war and i appreciate people changing their mind completely like, completely completely but it's it, it, it's shocking that it's took it, this long it should <laughs> annihilate their credibility permanently and to think the timelines involved here where it is 2024 we are talking you know i don't know when this uh the the famous roger veer finger happened which was totally justified in my mind right, right. But that was like what 2017 2018 it something was 2017, like that yeah yeah seven years ago in crypto that is like half almost half of of, of bitcoin's life 
ago. That is a lifetime ago. And yet these people for that long didn't do basic research from the beginning to understand how this system was supposed well, here, to work. The information was all there. there there's nothing really new. Yeah. Here, here's the here's the anatomy of this kind of thing, I think, is a big part of it is, and you see this in partisan political debates too, if it's easy to believe a story about people that have a different view of you that just makes them stupid or evil, <clears throat> then most people will believe that. And so when the block war stuff started happening, there was these things spun out that it's like, oh, Roger, uh, Roger is trying to make a bunch of money or whoever else was advocating for big blocks. They're, they're just, they're trying to, they're trying to like make money. They're trying to do something. They're trying to pull one over on you. And the assumption was anyone who favored big blocks they're just too stupid to know how Bitcoin on tiny blocks with lightning is supposed to work. And in reality, you guys all know this, all the people I know who were like on that big block side when BCH split, nobody wanted that split to happen. No. Nobody was like, I'm going to make a bunch of money from a split. Everybody was like, I only want there to be one Bitcoin. I want... If, if small blocks are the answer, I want lightning to work. Let me go see if it can. We exhausted all possible options mentally before determining that raising the block size was literally the only way. Like all the people I know that were into big blocks, at least early on, we all dove into whether or not lightning could work. And we all kept coming yeah. against things that were like, doesn't look like it can. I don't yeah. see how it can. There's no other option. We were like, the only option is big blocks. And I think the assumption was, that big block people never looked into anything. For some reason, they just religiously wanted big blocks. Yeah, I want to say one more point on this, and then we can move on to other topics here. Um, I have I have this thing that I've coined a term, which is like a, a fake coining because it's absurd, but I actually use it all the time. My wife and I use this term all the time. I call it intertemporal autocommunication. And that just means talking to yourself across time. Intertemporal across time autocommunication, you're talking to yourself. So a little bit of that is going on here, where if you put yourself back in 2017 when these debates were raging, do you remember how many attacks were leveled at the untechnical big blockers right. who didn't who didn't have the PhD in comp sci? They didn't. They weren't developers. They were right. they were crude, a bunch of numpties. Non, a bunch of numpties. The, the critical concept was non technical, non technical, non technical, right. and yet here we are. And those non-technical, many of them, I still consider myself non-technical. And yet somehow I was if able- you're, If as, you're non-technical, I'm a caveman. So. Okay, well, well, but but you still figured this out yourself, being a caveman, <laughs> that you were still able to follow through the technical concepts to a satisfactory level that led you to a correct conclusion in hindsight that even for technical reasons, lightning wasn't going to work because it didn't solve basic technical problems that we figured out and the non-technical groups and, and and plenty of technical people as well figure that out. So a little bit of intertemporal auto communication. We said going into the future, we know what that argument sounds like. Same thing with like some of the COVID vaccine stuff you, you, you know you brought up. And other there, there's this game that gets played, it happens in math all the time, it happens in physics. Oh, you're non-technical. You can't have an opinion. You're non-technical. Sorry, I've heard that before. I know what it looks like and I know what it sounds like when the non-technical people Get it right when the technical people and the sophisticates and the experts get it wrong. Mm. Woo. You got me going. That was a good one. Really. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, technical people are always wrong or something like that. But when you look at the incentive structure surrounding kind of any type of expert class and try to figure out the dynamics and sort of the social dynamics and the way they're perceived and what's rewarded and what's, I mean, academia is a great case of this. It's very easy to sort of predict the types of maladaptive outcomes that will emerge. And if you just do that, like from a dispassionate way, you can look at that and say, the odds that this expert class with these incentives produces the correct thing are probably lower than the wisdom of crowds and common sense and hundreds of years of uh, thousands of years of trial and error. Not not 100%, but it's probably lower odds. And unless there's some really compelling evidence, like the default assumption should be that the thing that sounds like a stupid idea probably is. Well, right? and also that there is a there's a way, there, there's a particular pattern of when an arrogant expert says things in his domain and is unwilling to engage with those he thinks are beneath him. 
So the fact of the matter is we had good technical analysis from big blockers saying, here's a set of very deep um, problems with a lightning network. We don't have a problem for what happens when the fees are high. My goodness, you have to make an on-chain transaction in order to use the lightning network in the first place. If the fees are $100, this doesn't make any sense. Okay. Is it a technical point? Kind of. I mean, it's a concept that everybody can grasp. So the, it sounds a particular way when the technical minds hand wave that say, ah, you know, I, I, it's beneath me to try to explain for these very sophisticated reasons we're going to solve that problem, but I can't really explain it to you now because you know you're two the your two standard deviations below me in my IQ. That that's exactly the same thing that happened with COVID vaccines. If you remember, there was a set of people who were saying, "Listen, this one time, I know you know it's not, our institutions maybe are captured, and maybe you could be skeptical, but this one time, you just got to trust for the really smart people." are on it and they're going to make sure that this technology is safe. That has a certain it, it has a is a predictable pattern to it when those guys are BSing. So, I would like to chat about the next topic, the Copa versus Craig Wright trial and all of the hilarity that has ensued. So, I'll just quickly say Derek and I did a uh, uh, one of these a couple of weeks ago before the judgment came down. And I am surprised because my take was nothing. We're going to walk away from this and everyone's going to basically be like the people who hate Craig Wright will be like, I'm validated. And the people who love him will be like, no, there's still a bunch of reasons why it's unclear and nothing really major will happen. The judge came down apparently much clearer than I expected in his judgment. And a lot of Craig Wright fans, not all, but probably maybe half or something. There goes that thumbs up again. Were actually rocked by this in a way that surprised me, given how deluded they have been in the past and how no amount of Craig's forgeries and stupidity seemed to shake them in any way. The fact that this one judge was like, this, this guy's not Satoshi, utterly wrecked them was actually kind of came as a surprise to me. So uh, my predictions were not entirely correct. I was actually a little bit surprised by the reaction to this, uh, to this ruling. Right. I, I thought, like, I, I was thinking he's probably just going to get destroyed. Like, I really, I, I started to believe that this was really the end for him, maybe, at least as far as the court cases go, and that there was going to be a, a really definitive ruling. Um, when you followed the close, the, the court case more closely, it, it was just became more and more clear. What did surprise me is, like you said, the reactions that people had, because it's like, all of this stuff has been going on for years, like the forgeries the it, there were even people who like I, I many people who i i've seen for years posting about both big blocks and also about bsv and craig who were saying stuff during the trial like oh oh yeah like this is clear craig's clearly going to win look at all this evidence he has like they were like completely on board this is you know definitive and the judge is going to rule in his favor and the judge does the opposite and it's like their whole worldview crashes and it's like craig's a scammer and it's like, which, which is, <laughs> which is honestly like, okay, I'm going to throw a bone to those people. It's a lot more consistent. It's than consistent. I Be because I mean, it's b bizarre to me because it's like, right. you've seen all the evidence already. And you are so sure based on what you yourself have analyzed that Craig was Satoshi and based on zero new evidence, one guy in robes in the UK said he's not. And that destroyed you completely. Right. Now you're like, I must have been wrong. That's shocking to me, but it's actually not inconsistent with what a lot of these people said. They were like, right. it's all about law. The courts deter the courts know the ultimate truth. The courts are never wrong about anything, right? <laughs> Clearly they've never been in like a horrible child custody case or something like that. Like they've never been, the courts are always right. And to their credit, a lot of them, not all, were like, oh, well now a judge said it. Now I guess I'm an idiot and I'm questioning my entire existence and I hate myself and I was part of a cult. And like, like it's crazy that the, the swing from 100% confidence, pre-judge pronouncing something, they had all the evidence to 100%. <laughs> I am completely wrong. How could I be so wrong? Right. It reminds me of what you were saying before of this gentleman who looked at the Satoshi emails and was like, wow, wow, <laughs> this would have made a big difference. And you're like, right. bro, that if, when, when Craig Wright, started his blog i don't know when that was and he's writing his little undergraduate essays about art history in the 14th century there was enough there to say okay clearly clearly 
there is some funny business going on here because this <laughs> dude is not Satoshi or this dude is not the person behind the white paper. There's like no way. No, no and, pe and people I, literally would read that blog and go sign up to like have Craig <laughs> teach them philosophy courses in the Slack channel. <laughs> it was and wild. I kept thinking, I, I, are I actually, we reading uh, the same articles? No, are I we, know. Are I, we reading I the had... same thing? I don't like to toot my own horn. Okay, I do like to toot my own horn, but it is probably my favorite yeah. ever uh, tweet on this topic. Somebody was like, Craig Wright, you know, he did 50 hours of theory of Bitcoin videos with Ryan Charles and blah, 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 blah. And now this judge is ruling suddenly like, whatever they said. And my reply was... <laughs> <laughs> that 50 hour video series was way more damning of Craig Wright yeah. than any judge's ruling. Like if you watch that, you're like, okay, whether or not he had anything to do with the creation of Bitcoin, who knows, but this guy is not some not genius. Mind. He's not yeah. the type who would be capable of doing this by himself. Certainly there's no way you watch that and walk away being like, this guy's a genius. Yeah. A judge right. saying, I don't think you're Satoshi. That doesn't mean anything to me. The, the the crazy stuff that Craig has said himself right. is so much more damning. Right. I think if you've if you've decided already he's Satoshi, I I I don't want to speak for Ryan X Charles, but like when I watched those videos, it seemed like because Ryan is a, a I think I think we would all agree he's a very intelligent person. And I mean, like maybe on a on a technical sense, on a technical I think he's, right. Like, like kind of his, his videos about Bitcoin in 2017 were fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So yes. what was going on, like in those videos with Craig, it was like, yeah. Craig would say something that doesn't make sense. And Ryan put it on himself. Like, yes, I need to understand this. I need to figure this out versus maybe my own judgment is right. And like, we saw this when Craig said, I remember one of the things we've all laughed about a lot was Craig was like, yeah, you know, Ryan understands maybe 3% of Bitcoin. Like he's not even close. He's basically an idiot, but he's smarter than all the other idiots. And everything like you're you're taking this abuse like this is like an abusive statement you're putting up with it and you know why aren't you what trusting your own judgment more or something like well there there was another part of that which is not just the self doubt the thing that I found I, mean, I think we talked about this one of the, in one of the Numpy's episodes a while ago the thing that the pattern one of the patterns that was there is Craig would dump out a bunch of claims and then Ryan would do the all the thinking. For him. So if there was some murky concept that could be turned into a clear concept, it was Ryan doing it himself internally. And he would go, oh, wow, look, Craig is saying all these brilliant things, not realizing that what Craig was doing was spewing a bunch of vomit everywhere. Some of those you would look at and you would take and then you would make sense of. And you go, well, wow, you know, the, here's the genius feeding me all this information. I saw that. I saw that pattern. I probably made it through like three of those videos. Because it was it was hard to listen to, and it was so much of that. Craig right. not explaining concepts clearly. He doesn't. There are, it, you know, it's sound when 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 somebody is really knowledgeable about a subject, with very few exceptions, they're able to take a concept, reframe it, repackage, right. reuse somebody else's language, try to see it from a different angle. It it, it has a particular way. You know, a, a really highly intelligent person has a particular way of talking, and Craig had virtually none of that present and it was so weird because ryan apparently wasn't picking up on that he was doing all the intellectual heavy lifting and he wasn't able to see that this guy wasn't didn't even know what he was talking about to his face for 50 hours well craig would also i mean i think i think everyone's like there's this pattern among small blockers and a lot of the bitcoin cash people that say craig speaks purely techno babble and everything he says is wrong and everything he says is stupid and that's not necessarily true i think right. A lot of concepts that Craig brought up were actually correct and very interesting. But when you actually start to look and dig into them, you realize they're not original to Craig. They come from other people. They come from like my current forum post or something like that. And a lot of people have just forgotten that these concepts were already talked about years ago. Yes. And if they were original, what you would expect to hear is somebody who has a consistent, coherent grasping of those concepts. Instead, what you would get from Craig is this gigantic, you know, palette of ideas. Some of them were good, but they weren't synthesized. They weren't integrated into a coherent, you know, understanding of the tech. Okay. For all these years, we've been doing these numpty things. We didn't have a good analogy for the way Craig's brain works because it's so hard for people to like, 
understand how he could say certain things that maybe sound intelligent or someone who is smart like Ryan could could turn into something intelligent yeah. or he could reference or know things that Mike Hearn did that everyone else has forgotten and also be kind of not very intelligent at the same time, right? He's Craig GPT. He's like <laughs> a large language model. He, I mean, Chad, imagine imagine if we got on a, on a podcast and if I had memorized, let's just say the titles, the, the table of contents for every book behind me. And whatever topic you brought up, I'd be like, oh, there's some book back here about architecture. I'm going to say the name of one of the table, the one of the chapter titles in the book and like mention it and then blab for a minute. If you're smart, you're going to go dig in and be like, whoa, that's actually yeah, kind of right. like an interesting reference. There's something, this guy must know something, but it, and, and that, and that comports exactly with what Derek has been saying for years. And Derek has even tested this out by like planting little Easter eggs, like dropping little things that he found from old Mike Hearn emails, explaining certain concepts. Sure enough. The next time Craig's on a podcast, he says that thing. And you're like, I know he just read that from Derek. Like, there's no way because he never said it before. And this is exactly how our buddy Phil Wilson described Craig's brain, right? Uh, yeah. if, if there's any possible world in which Craig had anything to do with the people creating Bitcoin, this is exactly what it would be. Hoovering up all this references and information and then just spitting out a bunch of random shit and being like, put this in there, but having no idea how it works. And, and Dave Kleiman described him kind of like that too, in more, more like nicer terms, but there was an uh, email from, you know, uh, sec list in 2007 or something like that, where Dave's like, yeah, you could give Craig a topic and he'll just like, send you back like a million references with all the instructions and- He's a large you know, language model. Actually, the, the the other one, the other comparison we've made for years, which I still laugh at, is the water boy coach. The, you know, the <laughs> coach stole the playbook, and like without the playbook, he's terrible. But if he like sticks on script, and there's this sense in which Craig, like without the Satoshi quotes and without Mike Hearn and without Gavin, without a couple other people that he's kind of looking at, and R Ryan X Charles came to the same conclusion. I saw him tweeting like Craig made himself appear intelligent by really doing a really good job of memorizing things Satoshi had publicly said. Right that other people had either forgotten or ignored and then just saying them without being able to defend them or understand them. When you go back and you look at like some of Craig's arguments about freezing nodes and court orders and stuff like that. Now he's, he talks about them in a really like kind of like insane malicious way, but that concept comes from discussions on Bitcoin talk. Mike Hearn, there's literally a post from Mike Hearn. It's like freezing Bitcoin with court orders or something like that, or freezing uh, Bitcoin nodes with court orders. And he describes a mechanism by which you could, in theory, send court orders to miners and get them to do stuff. And I think that that sounds reasonable. I don't want that, but it doesn't sound completely impossible or crazy to me. Right. And no, but almost nobody else was talking about that either. Almost nobody talked about it. So it's not like if you are not digging through, if you're like, let's say you got into Bitcoin in 2016 or 2017 or 2018 or 2019, and you're not digging through the history, you're going to see Craig's argument and be like, oh, that's novel, that's interesting, and not realize that, oh, in fact, there is a history here. And what Craig is saying is almost like just a paraphrase of what someone who's actually intelligent wrote. So a couple thoughts here. One, to, I guess, in a very, very minor way of like in Craig's defense, he did sound way less crazy earlier like when he yeah. first, when he gave that talk in arnhem where he's talking about raspberry pies and how stupid the small block argument is he only sounded like a little bit like an angry crazy person and he was mostly correct it was basic stuff it wasn't original but it was like there weren't very many people saying it and very few people willing to say it with such boldness and i think that moment that yeah. one talk is what made lots of people start saying hey this guy is interesting and then those same people went back and saw that video when he made the touring complete argument when no one really knew what he was talking about. But then later Clemens Lay and Ryan X Charles were like, Hey, we proved that it's Turing complete that like retroactively put this shine. Like yeah, Craig yeah, is yeah. a freaking genius. I don't know where that Turing complete thing came from. I don't know if the way that he described it is technically accurate or not, but that's like the one moment where like somehow, I don't know if anyone else was making that argument before him. Yeah. I had never heard that one, not to say it's not there. Um, I'd say that was, the, in fact, this was also something we had a, a numpty conversation on. Cause I asked TK at one point, what unique concept has Craig brought to the table ever that you would say, okay, this, this guy is onto something. And what he brought up was the Turing complete thing. And I think I said at the time, which I still believe, you know, that might be the one thing he said 
that more or less checks out. And he, they have the, that man has uh, sailed on the credibility games from getting that claim correct, that one claim correct, like, like nothing I've ever seen, you know, that, that, that one. And I, I think you said at one point, Derek, you might have come across somebody else claiming this maybe in the forums a while yeah, ago. I, I, gosh, I can't ever find it again, but like, and I could just be magic. Maybe, maybe Craig but, scrubbed it. Right. Yeah. I've been through the forums a lot and like really, really deeply finding stuff. And uh, I, I recall seeing something. It was like, is Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Turing complete? And it was like a claim that it was from like 2014 or 2013, mm -hmm, like buried mm -hmm. somewhere. I wish I could find it. I, I just, I can't say whether that was true or, or that or that not. would make a lot of sense and one of the other things that played into his favor is that the small blockers misrepresented his position because right. they said oh of course bitcoin script isn't turing complete it's intentionally not turing complete and it, and the claim was never bitcoin script is turing complete it was that bitcoin as a system is Turing complete these are two different claims and so he benefited from having the small blockers smear him like that you know well that was that happened a lot you know he would he would say something that is very similar to something that Mike or or Gavin said, and, and people would call it techno babble. And then you go look into it and be like, ah, oh, you know, there's some other smart people who are saying very similar things. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, it's 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 weird. Like I, I don't want to. What some of the people are doing, including Ryan X Charles, is like, oh my gosh, this this collapse of Craig in the court case has made me rethink my entire understanding of Bitcoin. And like suddenly everything yeah. Craig said is wrong. I'm not I'm not going to say that. I don't think everything Craig said was wrong at all. No, I mean, if if he's a large language model, he's absorbed stuff that most people have never read in these old conversations and emails and all this stuff. And he's saying a lot of stuff that's right. And like, here's the crazy irony. The basic technical model of BSV is is better like right. that's what's crazy about it is somehow now, I, you know, the mining and whatever, it's like all Calvin and whatever, but like the basic protocol itself, that's to me more or less what Bitcoin well, should be, which is I, wild. I still think like they're correct about, you know, the protocol shouldn't just be changed all the time. And you should scale now while you can. You don't want to scale later. You should go ahead and make sure like everything is ready for millions and millions of transactions or billions of transactions now versus, you know, because if you wait, then it becomes a political thing. Like we've seen over and over and over again. Like, I think there's a lot of concepts there that are completely correct. I don't think they're original to Craig, but certainly he was right. one of the, you know, the loudest voices, especially during um, the period of time where we had, you know, Bitcoin cash was going to split yeah. from BSV. Like, I don't think the Bitcoin cashers were like, were correct in their, right economic reasoning or their understanding of Bitcoin. They're still wrong. Well, and, we, and we've seen that the, one of the main advocates of the Bitcoin cash chain during that split, Amari Sachet, basically split off his own chain, the entire purpose of which is to just pay him money as a, de <laughs> as a developer. Yeah, right? no. well, that's fresh, a fair so. point. Yeah, so, that, this is it's not a defensive mid blockerism. No, right. Um, right. Well, can, uh, can, you, you mentioned Phil, though. Can we talk just for a moment about this? Absolutely, dude. Phil is still okay. my absolute favorite. No one takes so, him seriously. He's crazy. His story is insane, but it's also the story that makes the most pieces fit. Not all the pieces, but the no. most. No. So, so, I mean, as you guys know, right, I've always been the uh, 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 enjoyer of his story at the very least. And I've said, you know, without Phil's story, I would put Craig's credibility at zero. I have no reason to think that right. this is anything other than just a scammer without Phil's story. So, so now as we're getting more information, and I think you know the likelihood of Phil's story goes down, the more and more absurd that uh, Craig reveals himself to be. It's hard to even imagine that the diminutive role that Phil places Craig in is even accurate, because like the guy does come across as a scammer. A scammer. But I do want to say, I think part of the reason. Craig got away with his cult thing for so long is because people have a hard time believing that somebody could be so right just brazen as a liar. I do, I do like, still. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a shocking you know thing to entertain all along. This guy is just one hundred percent scamming. Right. Like it's, there's no uh, truth. If there's even a fraction of truth, right. but if there's zero truth whatsoever, it's it's is baffling. It's baffling. If, if there's zero truth whatsoever, the people who believe that there's zero truth whatsoever, they should be 
absolutely delighted and entertained with one of the most amazing cons yeah. we have ever seen by someone who does not seem capable of conning because he's yes. not smooth in any way. Like right. I, this wild. is something I, I've appreciated your take on this over the years, Isaac, because part of the the disbelief that you have in listening to this guy is you go, how could he be just a scammer? Because he's so bad at it. <laughs> he says such ridiculous things all the time that are self-contradictory all the time. How could this guy pull the wool over everybody's eyes? Like that, that's a valid point. I mean, but yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, so anyways, people have to adjust we all have to adjust based on you know our experiences what types of people are possible and you know the craig the cold-hearted scammer guy you know that's a possibility maybe people didn't entertain for me i don't have as hard time entertaining the idea that he's just 100 percent a scammer the person that was hard for me to understand that i've never seen anything like before would be phil and the reason's not because of him being a scammer, if he's a scammer, it's because of the way that he would have gone about doing it, which is, is in my mind, almost the opposite of Craig. Craig does not demonstrate conceptual understanding of very much. In Phil's story, the way if if he is a total scammer and just wanted he knows that you know Craig is a scammer and wanted a piece or something, or maybe he has some information on Craig and or whatever, for him to go through and analytically break down. Bitcoin in a unique way. These are unique concepts that the way that Phil is talking about how the blockchain works uh, and for him to, to retroactively go through step by step, this is how Satoshi would have been thinking about making the conceptual breakthrough of Bitcoin in a way that actually checks out conceptually. I've never encountered anything like that ever, I've, so I've, ever. He yeah, also so... <clears throat> he also has some interesting um, and I I've had some DMs back and forth you know that I've shared with you guys over the years <clears throat> but I won't I can't share them here but talking to him there are times where he he has some nugget of of insight into like Bitcoin history or Bitcoin lore that is not provable but seems very plausible and which seems which, to which if a... you were making up your story you wouldn't make a claim that looks. Right. Like it's not provable, right? Like there are there are several like that, and one that is more public is the sort of uh, the Bitcoin references and stuff like that. Like I remember mm -hmm. like him sort of talking about how yeah, like Wade I had nothing to do with it. The B money that was just something that Craig added later, like that, just for credibility and stuff like that, because he's he's that type of person, which he is, right? I mean, you read his blog post; they're more footnotes than than blogs. Um, but that explanation. It is something that's technically out there that like, yeah, if you like years ago, if you if you read the way die emails, you could kind of piece together this story that like Satoshi didn't actually know about it before he created Bitcoin. But Phil was one of the only people talking about it for yeah. a long time. And, and not to, like, uh, here you go. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, and not he wasn't leveraging this either. He, there's a bunch of pieces of his story, which sounds silly and absurd like this where that sound arrogant like what do you mean satoshi wasn't familiar with right. the academic literature and if if you have a particular perspective on the on the world which says yeah of course a bunch of competent engineers are not going to be steeping themselves in a bunch of academic literature because they're out there doing stuff in the real world you would expect to see right a, a, an engineer's manifesto would have claims like that but not not if somebody is a a fraudster like a low level fraudster. You'd imagine the low level right. fraudster would take Craig's approach, which is a bunch of unnecessary citations. I know all of this theoretical literature and that's how I created this. And Phil's like taking the opposite approach where he's like, yeah, I had a background in graphics and here's how the concept of, <laughs> I was thinking right. about graphics was incorporated. And then like I left and started my own scooter. I was, I was a security guard. And then I went to make a scooter startup that like failed <laughs> in New Zealand. Well, the yeah. thing about the references, which is fascinating too, is, it's very easy if you don't know how to think through this to to think that Satoshi actually did claim that Bitcoin was inspired by B money and, and Bit Gold and stuff like that because there are times where Satoshi said, right. "Oh, this is an implementation of B money. This is an implementation of B, uh, of Bit Gold," and it's like, "Oh, well, okay, I could see why someone if they read that would think that." But then if you actually go look through Wei Dai's emails and what he said, it's like it seems and and just the timeline of events, it seems very clear that Satoshi did not 
know about these things. So it takes a lot of work to come to that yeah. conclusion. I'm 100% convinced that that's the case, but it takes work to come to that conclusion. And, and it's like, it's kind of, I don't know, it's just, it's hard for me to imagine Phil it, coming to that conclusion on his own if he didn't it, already know it. Well, and it, it's consistent. It's consistent with some of the other early Satoshi things where there's clearly this Satoshi person or persons is clearly not just happy to be like, this technology is great. Everybody go use it. You'll figure out for yourself that it's great. There's definitely a concerted effort to be like, okay, we got to do image control. We got to get the right people to also think it's great. We don't want it associated with mm -hmm. illegal stuff. We want So this image management thing, okay, there's egos. We got to like say that it was inspired by these other great cryptographers to kind of graft off of their credibility. Like there was definitely a, it's consistent with the early, the picture of Satoshi as concerned with the perception, not just the technology. Yeah, and this that's is not why. just like copying a Satoshi quote. That's what's so interesting. It's like it's more like being inside his head. Like that's all true, but you have to. You, you. It's not like Craig, where you just go read a quote and you copy the quote. It's like trying to understand. Like that's a much harder thing to do if you're not that person. Right, and this is why I'm saying it's totally possible he's a complete fraudster. Hats off to him. But it's a it's a different type of fraud and impersonation that I've ever come across. And there's right. also possibilities here, which it's not just he's a fraudster or he is the mind behind, let's say, the white paper and the conceptual breakthrough. It could be that he has some sort of inside information here. Maybe he knew who Satoshi was and had a bunch of conversations with him. And that Satoshi wanted his st story told through Phil and it's mixed with a bunch of, right. you know, well, errors there. That's I also possible. I don't think mental illness is a very, like, like there's is, there is that one guy who keeps commenting, you're mentally ill, get help. Like, Okay, you know, I, you're one. It's kind of a weird like. Why why are you not thinking more creatively or like trying like trying to explain you know to yourself like read this and then try to like really try to give a rational explanation for how this 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 document that this bill wrote could exist you know like what are some other possible explanations if he's not Satoshi you know yeah. what you know what's wild is how few people still are even familiar with it At, almost every time I tweet anything about who Satoshi may or may not be. There's always a bunch of people that are like, it's Hal Finney right. or it's Adam Back or whatever. And I'm always like, oh, well, you know, what if it's Phil Wilson? They're like, who's that? And I'm like, vu.hn. I, VU .hn. And I can't like, tell you how many BSVers. Never heard of this before. Oh, I used to share it with BSVers because they, like, they'd be like, you know, Craig Satoshi, like, ah, have you read this? And be like, <clears throat> what's this? Yeah. Or we're like, Phil's a scammer. I'm like, have you read this? No, I haven't bothered to read it. I'm like, well, you should read it because it's interesting. And it, I mean, it's interesting even if it's not true. And I'm not saying it's true. I, I have no claim about who Satoshi is, but I just, I don't think that when people just write it off 100% that they're thinking very creatively. I also think when people say like, like back to you, Steve, about, you know, it's not, it's possible that there's some truth underneath all of this. As far as I'm concerned, even with Craig, like Satoshi can be a fraud and like Craig submitting fraudulent evidence to court is not necessarily alone right. evidence that he's not satoshi or not not involved in bitcoin in some way it, it's Phil, amazing phil's it, story is full of lies that itself does not necessarily mean that you know there's not some truth underneath it the the uh the people even like the big craig fans that they, a lot of them haven't even read the satoshi affair which is an amazing right. story of right. following craig around but but here's steve you said something interesting mm -hmm. uh at the beginning of this conversation about the phil stuff if you if you look at over time craig's continuing court cases and more and more forgeries and things that have come out and more and more craziness that he's willing to claim in court and how bold he is with these crazy forgeries and claims of being hacked it's easy to say that the probability that he's a hundred percent scammer keeps going up. But that is only if we take the view that I think is, is the default view. Most people take of someone they don't know personally, like a celebrity or a big name, which is you kind of treat them as a single entity through time. They just are one thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we know there's counters to that. Like look at Michael Jackson early in his career. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look at, look at Antonio Brown early in his career. And today look at Kanye West Craig has this arc and it's very easy to follow. He was always kind of like trying, desperately seeking status. It appears to me based on all right. the evidence. Yeah. Always has been desperately seeking status, full of braggadocio, probably like a bit of a pathological liar, right? Exaggerator, tinkering in a lot of stuff, jumping from job to job. There's things about him that I think have probably been consistent. But if you look at 
some of those early video clips of him talking uh, yeah. and the Arnhem talk even, and you can see <laughs> once he gets whatever, whatever money he got from Calvin air or whatever, and he starts wearing expensive suits and watches and, and apparently at least it looks like he actually had, or maybe still has, a lot of money. He's got a company end chain. He's a chief scientist and he starts getting more and more bold, more and more crazy, more like Kanye West. You start, you get high on your own farts and you're like, you just, it emboldens you to be more and more insane because you keep getting away with it and you're making money. And, and now people start to think you're cool. No one knew about Craig until the BSV split. He became a cult hero all of a sudden. And now he walks into a room and he gets a standing ovation when the Darth Vader music plays as he enters a stage and he gets up on stage with an all black suit and babbles and everyone does a standing ovation and goes crazy. Like that message, especially <laughs> if you're already a person whose main thing is I want status and I'm willing to brag to get it and, and, and exaggerate and lie to get it that changes fundamentally so craig of today is probably a totally different person who does not fit the description of craig and phil's story but i don't think that alone discounts the craig as presented in phil's story of being possible i, I think that's fair and also i think um there's a possibility that the you know cia got him or some of these uh en entities did mind melting stuff i was just learning about this historically you know there really have been attempts over in the course of the 20th century to figure out how to brainwash people and mind melt them with different drugs or other techniques. Who knows? I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I don't think it's uh, unreasonable. Dude, pe people imagine. start dying. People start dying in this thing. Hey, well, also, yeah. one, thing, one I, I, thing we could clearly show is, you know, we were kind of laughing at Craig's writing, but like prior to uh, whatever the crap heck he does now, prior to that, like, some of his like older writings on medium and stuff, they were kind of like full of typos and kind of like a little bit blustery and kind of manic almost, but they weren't like that terrible. Sometimes they, they were kind of interesting to read mm -hmm. and they were very different stylistically than what he does now on his blog. And so he seems like a person who can like, I don't know, like, how do you explain that? Right? Like he decided at one point, Oh, I need to be, I need, I can't write like this with all the typos and the, the weird, I need to try to be official. I need to try to look like a professional. So then he starts writing these horrible blog posts that that read like he's- You, you could explain it if, he he's in this, if he's in this desperate race after right. the failed public signing to find a way to make people think he's Satoshi. Let me just get tons of degrees and file tons of patents and publish tons of papers and then quantity, quantity, quantity. And I'll overwhelm them with a quantity of credibility signals, not but, realizing that the quality is so bad it works the, against you. The one thing is he was already making those claims years ago. Like there's this old argument that he had on, this is actually a, a funny one. He, he blocked me when I shared this with him, but he had that post on, uh, I forget what website it is, but it's a, it's a comment from 2011 where he's like, you know, Bit PayPal should have used Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is anonymous and untraceable and no one can stop it. Yeah, right. uh, anyway, uh, not, not PayPal. Uh, uh, WikiLeaks should have used Bitcoin because it's anonymous and untraceable and no one can stop that it. Old comment. Yeah, funny yeah. Now he's like, you know, it's traceable and you should stop it with a court order and stuff like that. But that's not what he said in 2011. And what's interesting about that, though, is during that thing, he's arguing with someone and he's like, I publish like a paper every week and I, I do this and that. And I have, <laughs> you know, so like he was already making claims like that. Okay. And by the way, there were plenty of plagiarism allegations in, you know, 2008, 2009. Like yeah, that seems to be, have always, always thought. Well, what, what, uh, wrapping up on this COPA thing. Um, I mean, speaking of people getting like their brain fried by, I don't know, MK ultra or something. Ryan X Charles just seems to be tweeting nonstop and saying he's going to do a lawsuit and everything. And I'm, and I'm sitting here and I'm trying to think through, I'm trying to be like charitable. What's the, what's the lawsuit? Like, Hey, I believed someone's claims, someone who had really poor credibility on the face. I believed their claims and invested my money and time according to those claims. Uh, I also made claims. I told people to sell their Bitcoin and to buy BSV and to do all these other things. And some people believed me like, so now I'm going to sue. I, I just, I don't get it. This idea that there's like a lawsuit here seems like, is this real or is this trolling? I truly can't tell. I don't he's know using if he's pictures real or of like trolling. rhinoceroses and 
It doesn't this, surprise I don't, me. I honestly don't know. It doesn't surprise me that there would be a class action lawsuit if there is one. I mean, these guys very publicly made pretty big promises as to what they were going to do to pump the price, to, you know, uh, crash the Bitcoin network. I mean, Calvin and Craig have both made very clear, very aggressive, very strong promises that people were using it to base their investments off of. I don't think but, you but should. Like I mean, people, I think personal... people make claims all the time. Oh, no, no, no. no. I'm not right? saying it should be this way. I'm just saying, like, I don't, I've seen dumber class action lawsuits. Is like, that's the thing. Like, I've, seen, I've seen very stupid. So it's not, I, I won't be surprised if there is one and if it actually like can work. I guess is, is what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't like for me, it's like you're you're personally responsible for for doing this. I mean, I, I don't know. I I, I don't... doesn't it seem doesn't it seem more embarrassing to be party to that it's class? Very action, embarrassing. Right? I like... would never participate in something like that. It's very embarrassing to go on Twitter and, and say something like, Wow, like, you know, I, I might not even be a big blocker. Like maybe, maybe that was just Craig all along. That that's kind of yeah embarrassing i mean it's it's been weird and and if, if that's true that speaks more to you than it speaks to craig like if if you you know that the, if you can get that duped i don't know like i i uh, it, it, we have that joke from whoever writes the soon times there's that funny hilarious we'll post never about know. uh richard hart not being charged because it was so obviously a scam yeah right <laughs> <laughs> right and it, it's like uh, He's like, I literally told them it was a scam. I named it scam coin. What do you want from me? It, it, it makes me think, you know, um, when we were doing the numpties more regularly and we're the hottest show in crypto, you know, I would say for me personally, maybe you guys don't feel this way, but I felt like I had just about the least popular take on Craig. And somehow I feel like it's, it's, has now been exceeded in its, in like how much people are going to hate this position because back then, right. It was the BTC people hate you. If you think Craig might've been involved in right. the creation of Satoshi. And then with the numpties, it was, you're such a Craig hater while you're shitting on him all the time. He's obviously Satoshi. And now a lot of those people are leaving the cult and they're like, oh, he's obviously a scammer. It's like saying the exact same thing. There's now right. almost nobody who could say after this case, well, yeah. he might have been involved. It's possible. <laughs> I mean, the when, inform Steve, when Steve Patterson is saying to the BSV people who are now angry at Craig, well, slow down, slow down. Yeah, Craig's right. not all bad. <laughs> we, we, um, I, you know, speaking of, of Ryan too, I remember he during that uh, series that he did with Craig, there was a part where um, there was a, a section on the Wayback Machine and Craig was trying to claim that the Wayback Machine had been altered and it was totally fraudulent, that claim. I mean, I don't know if Craig just doesn't understand the Wayback Machine and found this like supposed gotcha and was like, ah, see, like, you know. And, 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 and you put was, all the like, evidence together. I think we oh, yeah. talked about it on the numpties. I put the evidence together. I made a Streamanity video. I think Streamanity has gone now or it turned into like a porn site or something. But <laughs> I, I, I had a whole video debunking it and mm -hmm. it's definitive debunking really. I mean, and and I, I like sent it to Ryan on Twitter. I forget where I, I tagged him in it. Like, he could have watched it, yeah, you know, and like maybe maybe he just wasn't capable of 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 seeing that. But it's just like it's not like there was not evidence to the contrary, and you were just so it's it's weird, I think, to to just say you had opportunities to investigate it and you chose not to. Well, and and I even uh, I think you pointed this out, Derek. Ryan Ryan X was like, um, "Hey, I finally went through and read the um, Arthur Van Pelt stuff." Right, right. He never read them. He never read them. Like I've read all of them. I, I think they're, Damn. I think they're way, over, they're way too much editorializing. They're way over the top there too, but, but there's, there's, a, lot of, and there's a lot of good evidence up. And there's right? a, lot, of there's a lot of good stuff, but right. just the fact that you would never read that, like here's the most vocal guy saying that Craig is a fraud and here's all of his evidence. And you're putting your entire reputation saying things like Craig might be Jesus. And you haven't taken the time to look at that. And now you're going to go and try to say that you were wronged in some way. I'm kind of like, right. And same with, I think, Josh Hensley, who I don't think is claiming he was wrong. I don't know what Josh is. I don't think Josh is involved in that. But um, and I don't think, yeah, he's definitely not. I don't think. But, but anyway, so Josh also said, like, oh, I read I finally read Arthur Van Pelt's articles. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Maybe Craig's a fraud. And I'm like, really, this whole time you didn't 
Do people me really to... not listen like to both sides of an argument? Is that not a thing people seem to do? Well, that's the other thing is like I think a lot of those core people, the the, the Craig haters, one of the reasons that they're really not that convincing a lot of times is they don't they do the same thing. They might just be happen to be right this time, but they really don't bother to research it. And even Van Pelt's articles, like they're very interesting and well researched a lot of times, but he's clearly writing from a particular angle and with a particular goal. And he's not very creative at imagining other possibilities. Well, and it's so, and this is why I look forward to your book so much, Steve, because like every other sentence, it will be like Craig claimed hilariously and completely falsely the following. And you're like, just say what he claimed without always trying to prime your audience's brain so much. It's like so overwhelmingly, which it reads like a coin geek article. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. Yeah. I think, I think the, the lesson from, a lot of our time in, in this space has, has been just how shockingly under-researched everybody seems to be. Yeah. yeah. There's like very few people who actually take the time to, one, are willing to entertain other sides and then take the time to do it and are, are able to think creatively enough to imagine. Okay, I'm going to give you an explanation there. as to why that's not negative reflection on humanity. Here's why. Because crypto doesn't matter. Because it's a solution in search of a problem. It hasn't found a problem that's important enough. And so all you end up having is let's try to get rich. Let's play around. Let's have fun. Let's find a tribe. Let's have a community. And there's no reason if, if it's, if it actually was like, oh, damn, this solves a really urgent problem. You'd have two things happen. A small minority of people who would research everything and know everything, and they wouldn't be offended by differences of opinion because they'd be trying to solve technical problems. And a large majority of people who didn't learn anything at all, they just want to use the thing right now, which is how any technology that solves a major problem functions, like video streaming. The people who are building video streaming technology, it's like, let me understand how it works. Let me get in there and try to fix it. And then the vast majority of us don't know anything about how it works. We just use it. I think blockchain, for lack of a better term, technology, it solves this Byzantine generals problem. It's something that's so amazing to figure out how you have made like trust, you know, the, the ability to rely on something that strangers have verified that is this decentralized, like overcoming these information incentive problems. It's so cool theoretically, but they're none of the problems that solve people have cared about enough. They've all, they've been all vitamin, no aspirin, right? It's well, not like I have a headache, save it, save me. And here's my big teaser. No, but maybe, actually maybe AI and all of the proliferation of stuff that gets harder and harder to trust will start to actually create problems that necessitate blockchain as a solution. Maybe, maybe we're still too early. But it actually did solve problems early on and it was actually solving real things in like 2009, 2010, 2011. Like quick like international and, transactions and, and stuff and like on, that. And on top of that, Isaac, you're completely wrong because this is, you're taking <laughs> this, the this technical is what I like. angle. This is what I like. <laughs> you're taking the technical angle here. Sorry, a ton of people invested their own life savings into this. This was not a thing people were doing because, hey, it's fun. I'm going to have a community. Like people were really bought into this and they invest their life savings without doing the research. Right. Well, that's true. I agree. I, I don't think that's <laughs> like, I, no, I don't think that this counts the point. Like think about the stock market, right? That's what I'm saying. It's in a different category. It's like I see people making money here. I'm going to put a bunch of money here and, and people have various risk tolerances and willingness to do things based on, you know, hunches and whatever momentum. But I think like from a, from a usability standpoint, it was all, it's all been theoretical. So in a way, because it's not actually, cause here's the thing, it's not actually breaking because no one's using it. Why does nobody know that the lightning network sucks? Because there's no customer hotline to file complaints because there's no customers. No one cares. If you if you if Google all of a sudden starts working as terribly as the Lightning Network, what will happen? I mean pain will be felt yeah. by real people with but jobs. There was that in the past. No one's using that this did happen. Stuff, no, so but, no one cares that it's broken. Well, but also, you're, yes, on BTC, no on BSV. You're you're not getting into BSV because you're chasing a million fold gains. Like nobody, nobody saw that. So the people right, you're talking about. So BSV about, works, but no one cares because it works on solving problems that no one has. No, that's but the, my thing. The, that's no, my that's problem, my point. Like 
But the, your point was not to make a pessimistic claim about humanity. My claim is to make the pessimistic claim about humanity of those people that were involved. Okay, so, so, in, yeah, so, my, so your claim is like, these fools should have researched and the fact that they didn't is a is a horrible reflection of humanity. Imagine, imagine the, the, the how low a bar would have, you're, you're saying the bar is set in order to make the claim you just did. Like, if you're going to invest your life savings in a project in crypto that you hasn't never already by appreciated. setting the bar lower, Steve. It's lower. like, how can, you, how can you say more than like, it is not reflective on humanity, okay? Yes, there's a bunch I'm of people trying. who, okay, well, don't, don't, just speak the truth. That's all that's necessary. Like, uh, people but, invested but I'm, I'm a trying, ton I'm just trying into to make, this, I'm trying and to they did not do a, their research. That there's, a, that there's a rationality to it. Put, put, put aside whether it's good <laughs> okay. or bad. I think you're wrong, though. You're, this claim that there's it doesn't solve anything, or, like, maybe now that's true. Like, maybe the world has caught up a little bit. But, like, there was real pain in 2015 when the speeds started going up. And in 2016, there was real pain. There were businesses that were using it that got shut down, basically. But and not, but not very many, right? Not very many. Because well, it was brand like, new. It, it was exactly. That's my point. That's but I'm saying there point. were so actually I, real things that were solved. Like I, I think you're. We've become so pessimistic about crypto in general, and so like, oh, this is just like the new CBDC. We forget that like there were legitimate uses early on, and it might be the case that if it had just been allowed to grow, it would have shot oh, past yes, well, I, I agree that like it had a window where things like small casual payments we didn't have venmo paypal able to do these two dollars one dollar things all the time that we do now if if uh international stuff is still terrible frankly but the regulators have come in and crypto doesn't make that really much easier in most cases especially you're a legitimate business that has to do like accounting audits and stuff um there are real things i agree but you look at where we are today there's nothing that current to the mass person that crypto does that they actually need. It's all interesting. Like, I, cause I, I tried really hard. Cause to me, these micropayment ideas so fascinating that you just can't do that with fiat, but there's nothing currently that micropayments do 10 times better than the status quo. And to get people to completely change, you gotta be five or 10 times better than the status quo. It's like, eh, maybe this is a little better, but then I gotta onboard and offboard. I don't care, right? No one's feeling the pain. And maybe in an internet proliferated with AI everything, where trust is at an ultimate low, there starts to become new problems created that a decentralized trustless system is actually necessary for to prove validity, time stamping, ownership, transfer, chain of custody, et cetera. Okay, but I'm not going to let you get away with it because you changed the claim. The claim <laughs> was not about BTC and crypto. The claim was specifically about the people in BSV. You were trying to say the people in BSV were actually acting rationally by trusting Craig and it really wasn't Oh, about no, 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 I wasn't making that. I was saying people in crypto in general that we we wouldn't it shouldn't be surprising that no one's really digging in to figure out how this stuff works it technically depends on what who does you, and doesn't depends work on because, who you're talking about because there's no real use case anyway okay it's but in BS, you don't think but, it's but, surprising that a a person who's like an expert supposedly an expert doesn't bother to read basic background information yes except what are the costs and what are the, if there's no cost if it, because if you if you don't understand in any way the way that Gmail works and you work at Google and you completely break Gmail, there's a huge cost because a ton of people feel pain immediately. If you don't understand the way that Lightning works or BSV works or whatever, and you're making claims, there's no cost because like 13 people are using it and no one notices when it doesn't work. That's my point. I mean, and BTC, okay. like, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more people using it if you're out there saying that lightning network is this amazing thing and you've never bothered to run a node I mean, you that's my point though well, you can get away with it because no one else is running a node either well so they all just leave Derek, you to derek's point though that this wasn't the case back in 2017 and earlier because bitpay for example they were at one point they were processing or on track to process a billion dollars worth right. of payments. That's not an insubstantial amount. I mean, it's not an overwhelming amount. But How it's much not of it was Roger Ver sending money back and forth to himself? <laughs> no, this is actually for goods and services. I don't know what the, what the, I can probably figure he that out. Though. He doesn't do that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the claim they made. No. Um, uh, okay. So hang on. Oh, I had a really good point. Okay. Yes, Sorry. here it was. Here it is. Um, 
You know, something jumped uh, uh, in my head after the audiobook that uh, something I didn't appreciate the significance of actually until not even just writing a bit, uh, reading it aloud. I thought, oh, wow, I can't believe this was this was really critical here. It, it was a BIP 101, just uh, for people who are interested in this. BIP 101 was the Bitcoin improvement proposal that was put into um, Bitcoin XT, which was run by Mike Hearn. And specifically, what was interesting about BIP 101 that I didn't quite appreciate until recently is that it it increased the block size limit, I believe, to eight megabytes. And I, I think this it was uh, BIP 101. Every block after that, it was a small increase in the block size limit up until I think the new limit was like two gigabytes or four gigabytes or something. It was like several thousand transactions per per second. And it hit me, oh, th this one thing actually, just this one BIP would have solved um, almost all of this be because it would have been something that would never need to have been revisited, at least not until we're talking you know, mass scale, because it had built in a constant adjustment and increase of the block size limit. And I, I had sort of, I sort of missed that historical nuance that that one really could have solved our problem. Even if, even if we had, um, uh, Let's say we had BIP 101 and we still had Bitcoin Core. So we had BIP 101. Let's say Bitcoin Core merged it, which people were hoping Bitcoin Core was going to merge BIP 101. But you still had Vladimir. You still had Greg. You still had Peter Todd. I wonder if just getting that one through would really have solved the problem um, in the long run because the blocks just would have kept increasing in, in, in size. Maybe. It's hard to know how already dedicated to trying to keep, to create the need for this liquid and lightning, all this stuff there, like, was there a group that was really dedicated to that early on enough to find another way to crimp it? Or was it sort of like a sure. series of little accidents and mishaps where all of a sudden the opportunity was realized and seized I mean, they, on later? They could have had RBF, which is a bad idea, but I'm not sure that was a bad enough idea um, that it would have totally broken it. I just think right, I mean, so. RBF would, RBF is a much bigger problem with, tiny blocks and mempool backlogs and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I think this is a good place. This is a good place to wrap it up for the, uh, for the episode. Any, any final uh, funny thoughts, comments, who wants to, to give us something to, to give the people as we sign off? We are uh, all Roy Murphy, except Craig Wright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have two notes. One, pick up a copy of hijacking Bitcoin. It will be released April 5th. You can get a paperback version or a digital version. I'm not sure when the audiobook is going to be done because sometimes it takes them a little while to um, accept that into Audible, but hopefully that'll be done by April 5th. And two, if you're a BSV person that has had the worldview shattered, at least give Phil Wilson's story a read, okay? If you, you have your excuse now. It's vu.hn. Just read the story and see what you think. Right, maybe, maybe, maybe it will bring you a little bit you'll feel a little better about yourself maybe it's like your your, yeah. your worldview is not completely broken um what was i gonna say um are we gonna get signed copies of the book maybe i don't know we'll see if if, if i get sued by tone vase for mocking him then no <laughs> how was that mocking him you just did it you did a very flattering <laughs> I wasn't mocking him. because well, you I'm can't kidding. not laugh hearing that voice <laughs> yeah, because the point uh yeah i suppose the point was uh only it's a, a self-owned, you know, <laughs> look, the only thing I'm going to say signing off is always read what Steve writes because it's always correct. And always listen to Derek when it comes to two things, the history of anything and a pulse for the vibes and the zeitgeist. <laughs> He's always got his finger on it somehow. It's amazing. So, well, you got to pitch, you got to pitch yourself too. That's two of the three numpties. I, I, got, I got nothing. Isaac? I'm just a big numpty here. I got nothing. I follow <laughs> these guys. Uh, my job is to go figure out how to get TK back on here and I keep failing at it. So, good, good right, to see guys, you guys. This is fun. I will uh, end the recording here. <laughs>